everybody. Thank you for coming. Diane Carroll asked me to do the introduction. She couldn't be here today. Not that Dr. Addie needs an introduction. I told her that there would be a great turnout because she is a big draw and I knew I would be right. So thank you for coming. When the session is over or when you need to leave, please just um, give me your feedback forms. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Um, I'd like you all to draw a pig. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> when Diane asked me to do one of these sessions, I remember talking with her about a topic and then I couldn't remember what we talked about. <laughs> so anyway, um, I thought I would talk a little more about leadership and about some of my thoughts around leadership and the, both the good and bad examples that I have seen in my life. And um, I would encourage everybody to feel free to speak up, to ask questions, to comment, whatever comes to mind. Do not hesitate. Um, this is a little bit of a weird setup for this room, but we'll get through it anyway. So um, Gary Larson is one of my favorite cartoonists. So he always has something that strikes my fancy. And this was one of the ones that I found one time um, that I thought was pretty appropriate. Because oftentimes when people talk about leadership, when talk about um, how to <coughs> organize groups or do whatever leadership actually means. This is the feeling. So, oh my God, I hate, used to have. I had a friend who used to say, "What's a poet like me doing in a place like this?" <laughs> and that was also a, one a feeling that many shared. And then this is what I call the leader's nightmare. Can you read that? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> And that's often how it feels. I think we've probably all been in that position at one time or another, expected to know something that we're not sure we actually know. So anyway, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some things I have learned over the years and things that I have come to believe in my interactions with people and um, things that I believe uh, are pertinent. And starting again, leadership and behavior is often consecutive. Contextual. So for me, it's important to look at the environment in, the, in which we are operating, things that are going on right now, and I think we can relate to this. Um, things that are driving, and this, by the way, Robert Theobald wrote this book, The Rapids of Change. I hate to say how many years ago, I don't even actually remember. But many of the things that he wrote about probably 25 years ago um, are coming true or still true today. He talked a lot about the principle of full employment. Look where we are today. We brag about our low unemployment rate, blah, 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 not knowing exactly what that means. We talk a lot about um, consumer consumption. It's the consumer that is driving the economy right now. Otherwise, everybody would be in trouble. Um, specialized education, we're very much into that right now, and our enchantment with technology. Um, all of the things that we talk about, the things that we want technology, the problems we want technology to save or solve for us. Um, I worked with a faculty member many years ago, and um, he was a computer science faculty. And he said, you know, when we first got into this business, the belief was that technology would save us time. He said, all technology has done is make the expenditure of time less predictable. <laughs> Think how true that is. Uh, every time your computer won't work. <laughs> or um, something goes wrong, or the car won't start, technology, everything, it just changes how we view, how we spend time. And then, of course, the other impact of society at large is war, and we've experienced that in a variety of ways over the past generations, and probably will um, to come in the future. So according to Theobald, then the, the counter forces to all of these things that seem to be driving our society all along would be any anti-war movement. Right now, the environmental movement, who knows where that's going to go. Um, I haven't read today what's happened in Davos or with Greta Thurn Thurnberg. Yeah, and uh, all the, she, she has become a symbol of the environmental movement. God bless her at age 16. But it takes that kind of passion to get something going, or even an anti-technology movement. I am waiting for the time when more and more people decide, I've had it with Facebook, I've had it with Twitter, I've had it with whatever. And going off the grid might mean more than just generating your own electricity. 
you know, it might mean things a lot different. That, that very well could happen, and uh, we just don't know. But if it does, then that would shift how we operate in our society. Also, Theobald said that if we want to change anything, it's going to happen locally. And going back to that whole um, that saying, I don't know who came up with it, all politics is local. Change occurs at the local level. It does not occur at the national or global level at least according to what he believed. And I think there are many ways in which we can see that that's true in our own lives. If we're going to change education, for example, it happens classroom by classroom, student by student. It doesn't happen because of some decree from somewhere on high. And that the, the saddest thing of all is that institutions per se are not designed to foster change because that threatens the very existence of the organization and why it was created to begin with. So these are just things to think about, but all of the things swirling out there, this is the environment in which we live and the environment in which we are expected to be leaders, whatever that means. So questions, comments? Yes, and the technology thing I wanted to share. I tried to pay three medical bills this weekend, and I was calling all of them, and one of them gave me a technological solution. Five minutes later, after punching in like 100 numbers, I got it paid. The other two, said, you have to create an account with oh, this yes. new entity. <laughs> and, I it. and I pulled up my checkbook. And I haven't seen my checkbook in like three years. <laughs> 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 so I am totally, when you said yes. that, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm just shying away from some of the technology. Yeah, I am too. And I had a bad experience Christmas Day. I was checking online, checking my bank account, and found out somebody had withdrawn $3,500. <laughs> And of course, I called the bank immediately, but they weren't open on Christmas Day. Because it was a holiday. Not even their fraud department or whatever. They weren't open. So I finally, when I, I was out of town, when I got back, I made a personal visit to talk to the bank people in person. Oh, yes, we'll send you a new ATM card, blah, blah, blah. So they sent me a new card. When I got it, I tried to activate it. They had sent me one with the same number as the account I had just closed. <laughs> I mean, I have spent hours on what should have been a very simple thing, uh, no fault of mine, I don't, I still can't figure out how somebody got my um, debit card number and withdrew that amount of money. It's been put back by the bank, but of course now they're going to investigate to make sure that I didn't make all that up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, technology is very unpredictable and it does not always solve our problems. So I can, I'm thinking about, you know, buying a, a little home safe and <laughs> not even having a bank account in my life. <laughs> Those things happen. That does happen. <coughs> Bob Theobald, by the way, I will say, I did have a chance to meet and work with when I was in, uh, where was I? Connecticut, I guess. Fascinating man. He has since passed away, but fascinating, fascinating man. A wonderful thinker. This book, The Rapids of Change, is quite revolutionary. Okay, so when we get down to the personal level and we're talking about leadership, what really are we talking about? First thing is, you can't be a leader if there's nobody to follow you. I used to, in the previous life, I was a part owner of a t-shirt business. And um, one of the t-shirt transfers that we had, actually we sold a lot of, I had one, I can't find it anymore. But it says, I must hurry and catch up with the others for I am their leader. <laughs> but in a way, there's a lot of truth to that. You can't lead if there's nobody following you. And that's part of the trick of defining leadership. It does take practice. We get better at this supposedly as we go along, as we get older. And that's not always true, but we're supposed to. We can have positive leadership. We can have negative leadership. Is there anybody in here who has not worked for a bad leader? Yeah, I don't think so. I've had my share. But you learn from those people as well. You can learn what not to do from negative leadership. And sometimes we don't even know what we're talking about. It's just, well, it's like pornography. I'll know it when I see it, but I can't tell you exactly what it is. That's often what people resort to when talking about what is it about leadership that can be positive or is helpful. So, I've developed a list, not necessarily in order of importance, um, but lists of things as I think about them that to me define 
a leader? First of all, you have to have a basic level of intelligence. I mean, that's, that's probably just a given. Some of these things are very obvious. But basic intelligence and common sense. Without those two factors, it, nobody would follow you, so you couldn't be a leader. I have found that there is, um, when I look at the next one of no aversion and taking risks, sometimes um, leaders think that, or people in leadership positions think they have to be innovative and creative and do everything um, avant-garde and um, try untested theories and untested um, ideas. Well, I would say instead that while that can be important, and one shouldn't be averse to taking a risk now again with a new idea or uh, a new concept about something. That just taking risk for the sake of taking risk is also not a sign of good leadership. But you can't have an aversion to it. You can't operate in a really safe, predictable environment all the time and provide leadership. Because sometimes the things we do that are unpredictable lead to the, the best results in the long run. It should be also obvious that a leader should be honest and have integrity. Um, these all seem, don't these seem like common sense things? I mean, pretty obvious to me. A sense of humor does help because really this is a very absurd world we live in. And if you can't laugh at yourself and laugh with others, um, then, then nobody's gonna pay any attention to you. It's also true that a leader must have a thick skin because everything, if, can I use the little swear word? <laughs> okay. Okay. I didn't put this on there, but here's what I've learned: shit flows uphill. Okay. A leader Could you will say get, that louder. Yeah. Say that louder. <laughs> the leader will get blamed for anything and everything, whether it's the leader's fault or not. And so whenever, we see this a lot right now, somebody within a corporation, for example, does something wrong, who gets the ax? The CEO, um, who, or somebody above the person who has done something egregious in addition, hopefully, to that person. But you have to have a thick skin. You have to be able to take criticism. You have to be able to not see things personally, because often it isn't personal, but it, it can be just, you're in a position as a result of your job title, your classification, whatever. And um, oftentimes things hurt. Comments that you hear people say. But you've got to develop a thick skin and say, okay, I hear it, I'm going on. One of the things that I like best about working in community colleges is that I have found that most of us have a real passion for the work that we do. And usually those who don't have that passion don't last long they find their way out the door without our help. So a characteristic, I think, of a very effective leader or somebody in that role is a passion for what he or she is doing and an enthusiasm for it. We've got to believe in what we're doing, otherwise we can't convince anybody else that anything we say is important. The other thing here then is the belief in people. I think a good leader has faith in the, the people who are being um, led, a faith in the general um, capabilities of everybody, an ability to trust, an ability not to, to step back and say, here's what I need you to do, and I trust that you will do it, and not get into a position of micromanaging. I, I've worked for a micromanager, and that is just hell on wheels. Sean, comment. Can I go back to the thick skin? Yes. <laughs> So like, did you always have a thick skin, or did you, can you talk about how you may have developed thick skin? Um, no, I haven't always had a thick skin. I, okay. Do you now? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I'm trying to, I'm just editing my own thoughts here, sorry. You know, I've got a, a lot of stories I can tell. Um, I think I have developed a thick skin because of some things that have happened to me in my career. Um, okay, I'll use my first example. 
I got into a tenure battle when I was a faculty member. And um, I was the only female in a department of 17 men. And this was many, 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 many years ago. Um, a couple of them decided that I was too assertive, too mouthy, too something. And I did, didn't fit the mold. I wasn't. I was, I was young and cocky, too. I was only 25, 26. So I thought I knew what I was doing all the time. I'd had a couple years teaching experience already. This was my first college experience. So anyway, as I look back at it now, I analyze it differently. But I, what I was going through at the time was that um, they decided, my department chair and the evaluation committee decided not to recommend me for tenure, which meant I lost my job. So I got the letter telling me I wasn't getting tenure in my mailbox at school right before I was going into class. Um, I was very upset when I got to class and I, I told my class about it. And they were, this was a freshman composition, they were outraged. And a couple days later marched, uh, there was a board of trustees meeting where they were going to vote on it. So all my students showed up at the board meeting and uh, the president, to his credit, um, said, well, then we're going to have to investigate this further. But he also didn't like me because I was a friend of his daughter, and she was going through a divorce, and he didn't like that. So, you know, I had, I had a lot of things going wrong at the time, which I was very, I was distraught. I was really very, very hurt by all of that. Yes, I was, I did not have a thick skin about that. I couldn't objectify it in any way, shape, or form. So I decided um, what all mouthy females do is fight back. Um, we did go to that board meeting. The president changed his mind. He decided he needed to investigate this a little bit further and found out that it had my whole evaluation thing was a setup. One of the people in the department said, well, she got a negative evaluation this year. We weren't trying to get rid of her before now. I mean, who says that? <laughs> yeah, so anyway, the president changed his mind, and I was granted tenure. So I promptly resigned. <laughs> um, and then a year later, I filed a, two years, no, two years later. At least two years later, I filed a discrimination suit with EEOC because I had then applied for a job in Virginia and got through the search committee. I was to be the, the first female department chair of the humanities department at a community college in Virginia. Got all the way to the chancellor, who was a friend with my previous president, who called him, was told I was a troublemaker and he shouldn't hire me. So I filed a suit, and, which I won seven years later. Um, that was when Clarence Thomas was head of the EEOC. The good old days. So anyway, you know, that's a long story, Sean. But no, I didn't always have a thick skin. My point is that sometimes the negative things that happen to you help you learn the most about being a good leader. I vowed to myself that day or during that whole event. And I can see now I was mouthy. I was, yeah, I was probably some of the things they said. But I vowed to myself that day I would never treat anybody the way I was treated. And I think that's a lesson in leadership. If you get in a position where you have influence over somebody else's life, remember the things, how you want to be treated. That's simple. That's the golden rule, is it not? I vowed that I would never, if I was ever a president, I would never behave the way I had seen some of the people I reported to behave. And I think I've kept that vow thus far. So, anyway, any other questions? Since it's true confessions. <laughs> <laughs> A few more. One of the things that's the most difficult to do, I think, for us, and a characteristic of growing up, is that we can think longer term and think about consequences. All of this stuff about the teenage brain, and many of the students that we deal with, and the whole thing about brain development, the inability to think down the road, well, now, if I, 
if I run this stop sign and there's a cop sitting there, isn't it possible I'll get a ticket? No, I'm gonna run this stop sign because that's what I wanna do right now. So once you're in a role of leadership, you have to think about long-term. If I make choice A, what's gonna happen down the road? There are always ripples. There isn't anything that we can do that isn't related to something else. So every decision we make creates an impact somewhere else. And a good leader has the ability to think down the road and follow those ripples and see where they go in order to make the best decision possible. One of the things that's hard for people, I think, to remember also is that the leader isn't always the one at the front of the room. There is a lot of good leadership that occurs everywhere, even from those in the back row. Um, it's, it's not the person who gets credit for things happening. It's not always the person in the front of the room, but the leader is in there somewhere influencing what's going on and influencing people. I think that one of the things, maybe the one on the, the right-hand side is, in my view, maybe one of the most important. You just have to, be, and this goes along with developing the thick skin, I think. You have to be comfortable with who you are. And just say, okay, this is who I am, this is what I believe, I'm not perfect, but here I am. I don't have to prove anything to anybody. Um, the worst leaders that I have worked for have been those who have been the most insecure about themselves. And we can all think of examples probably, can't we? So you just have to be comfortable with yourself. And I think that helps other people be comfortable as well. Sometimes you're gonna be right, sometimes you're gonna be wrong. And finally, um, I, I do believe that people are basically good. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> Um, no, but I don't think you can be a pessimist or somebody who is a misanthrope and be in a leadership role. You have to believe in the goodness of people, and that's how you get people working together. It's a, a positive approach to life rather than a negative one. So to me, these are the most important characteristics of a good leader. Comments, questions? Am I wrong? Right? Eh? I think it's relative sometimes. Yeah, especially rather. the thick skin. Yeah. <clears throat> um, for instance, working in a uh, construction crew. Yeah. Is a different kind of thick skin. Oh, I'm sure. Than working here. Yes. You know? Yeah, um, this is tougher. <laughs> <laughs> this is the toughest. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, between all the jobs I've had, it's, it's relative to the people and the organization. I work for. Um, a business that was all family. Yeah. I was the only yeah. outsider, you know. So that's, tough. that's different. <laughs> that's different too. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. And Paul, um, this is the toughest. Talk to me more about what you mean by that. Uh, I think that with the construction crew, there's a level of expectation going in of what you're going to face, and yeah, you know, people are. Um, maybe it's a little more. Uh, it's less transparent, the kind of confrontation that you're going to face. Mm -hmm. Where in other organizations, you, it, it, it's a little yes. more behind the scenes, yes. or, or maybe a little more. It's less direct. Gossip. It's less direct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it's tough to work in this kind of an environment or in an organization of business, um, because. Let's face it, in education though, we are trained to be critical, are we not? <laughs> okay, so it's really easy, and that's what we're training our students to do in many ways too, is to be critical, to think critically, to analyze, to synthesize information. We, are, we have been trained that way. So it's pretty easy to take those uh, characteristics and carry them through in an organizational setting, so we're very critical of each other and critical of what's going on and what can happen. And that criticism is always not very direct, but it can be subtle, it can be behind the scenes, it can be, I don't know, not in your face. And we have then our, our collective bargaining units and, and things to protect, to protect us to make sure that we're being treated fairly. So there are a lot of layers of 
rules and regulations and expectations that make direct communication very, very difficult sometimes. Dulcinea? Uh, to your list, I like all the things you had. I agree with them for, for what that's worth. Um, but the, uh, one other thing I would add in that's, the, that's so critical to a leader is uh, communication skills, mm -hmm. um, both the listening side and the um, whether it's written, whether it's verbal, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I just, to me, in my many, many different uh, million jobs, um, that's that to me one of the most critical mm -hmm. is the leaders that couldn't communicate even if they had other stuff. It was like, yeah, it was really too bad. Yeah, I, that's a good point. That's a good point. I will add that to the list. Yeah, yeah. Listening skills. Half of communication is listening to what other people have to say, not just always being talking. That's kind of what I mean. You're not the leader isn't always the one in the front of the room. You have to listen. Otherwise, you can't figure out what it is you're doing together. And that's what it is. Yes. Anna. I wanted to uh, talk about sense of self and comfort in your own mm -hmm. skin. I worked for a leader who I think went to the extreme with the comfort of their own flaws. Mm -hmm. And more than once she would say, oh yes, I suck at that. You know, like, no, I, I suck at follow-up. I suck at details, mm. you know, kind of accept me for who I am. And I'm a visionary. And we're like, well, you're a leader. We need some leadership and guidance and decision-making, actually your physical presence at the meeting, you know? And she's like, I I'm, I'm bad at that. You know, so mm, she's good. very comfortable. And I had to stop after several times and I say, admitting that it's your weakness is not an excuse for trying to improve at it if mm -hmm. you're in the position where people depend on you for some of the executive decisions. Yes, that's a very good point. When I was thinking of this, I wasn't thinking about admitting it to other people. <laughs> but you have to know yourself well enough to, to know your strengths and weaknesses, but be okay with that, but not, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. You can't, yeah, that, that just doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. Because part of leadership is at least inspiring some level of confidence. Otherwise, why, why would I follow somebody who says, I, I'm, that's, I'm right. terrible at that? On who doesn't show that they want change. Right, right. exactly. We're all terrible at something. Something, but if but I'm comfortable with it, that's a different story. Yeah, I acknowledge that I have things that I need right. to work on, but it's, you know, I would hope that I'm still a work in progress. Yes, mm -hmm. but yes, we all are. Showing those kinds of struggles to people I think can be useful, but show that you struggle with them, not just the, my students will say things in class like, well, I don't mean to be rude, but it's like everything that they say after I'm supposed to excuse. No, right, because, because they said that. Right, because they, they said the statement, so it's okay. Um, when I was in the South, it was bless her heart. Um, yeah. <laughs> and everything that comes after, it's okay whatever you say, because, you know, bless her heart. Uh, <laughs> like, well, that was racist and probably racist as well, but yeah. I'm yeah. sure. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But th those types of pieces, I think it can be... It can be useful to be able to show places of growth and struggle yeah. um, with a, perhaps, as you said, editing first. Yeah. <laughs> yes, a little self-editing can go a long way. But yeah. Other comments? Does this list does my list make sense, Lisa? Um it's it just um one one comment on leadership in terms of uh, kind of piggybacks on listening listening and communication skills. But in terms of um, managing, listening to entire, an entire community versus just listening to a few, a trusted few, mm -hmm. can sometimes um, impair, you know, sort of um, mm -hmm. direction to a goal or um, um, a vision, I guess. So I didn't know if you had any thoughts on, on that and, you know. Do you develop a trusted few? Do you do you have a forum for open communication? How, how do you navigate that, I guess? Uh, that's a really good question. I think my first response is that I think it's natural to surround yourself with people who agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and who will tell you the things you want to hear. But I think also a characteristic of an effective leader is to also talk to and listen to those who will disagree or will have a different perspective. Um, 
yeah, I, to me that then goes back to being comfortable in your own skin mm -hmm. because it should be okay to have differing opinions with people. That doesn't mean that they're, they're wrong or that you're wrong. It means you have different ideas about things and often the most creative solutions to problems come from sharing different perspectives. But it is tempting only to hang out with those who think the way you think. I mean, and that's tempting for everybody. We all choose our friends based on people that we have something in common with, usually. So, but that's, that's a good point. It's an interesting point that I think that people who are in leadership roles need to constantly be aware of. We've got to hear all sides of the story. See, and that's what I think I might have said this at the uh, all college meeting, I don't remember. <coughs> but one of the things that I learned definitely many years ago, and it's the, it's, these are somebody else's words, but where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit in the organization. So you have to constantly be aware of those different perspectives. Yeah, consciously take advantage of, that's listening. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I was just going to say it's uh, always good to question things, uh, you know, good to ask questions. Not necessarily questioning what you're, you know, why we're doing something, but, you know, just for instance, I'm going through my external review. I've asked uh, people about how to, you know, navigate this issue and, and to do it correctly and to work on it. And it's, don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to people. And I think that also makes a good leader to not have the answer to every question. Yeah. You know, because you don't. You no, don't. You, at all. You certainly. And you can't have that mentality either, where especially if you're doing something you haven't done before, um, you, you can certainly screw it up thinking that you have every answer. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, the first time that I was in a, an organizational position of leadership at a community college, I was a dean of students, actually an interim dean. I've been interim a lot. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the dean left to go somewhere and I was asked to fill her position. And I can remember the first couple of weeks in that role, the three words that came out of my mouth more often than any were, I don't know. Somebody would ask me a question, I don't know. I've never thought about things. I've been a, a counselor and a teacher. And so thinking about things from the point of view of a librarian or the coach or the housing director or uh, somebody else was brand new. And I said, gee, I don't know. But the other part of that is, I'll find out. And we'll figure this out together. But yeah, that was a shock to think, I didn't know there were so many things I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how you find out. Yeah. <laughs> that is how you find yeah. out. I just wanted to make a small comment here. One of the classes I taught was on global business, and one of the um, modules there was on the impact of national cultures on preferred leadership traits. Ah, so you have to be very aware that your model of leadership might not be the same model of leadership if you work with the people from the Middle East, True. or from <coughs> East Asia, or from Russia, or you know from African countries, because what desired leadership traits are there might not be what you've been working on all this time, like humility or asking for help. Mm -hmm. That will not be viewed very well there. So you have to kind of expand your model of leadership if yeah. you become a leader in the multicultural environment. Yes, that's a very good point. This, you're right, a lot of my assumptions are based on my Western culture, culture, on Western culture and what it takes to be a successful leader in this country. Yeah, that's a very good point. So don't take this outside. <laughs> <laughs> Forget you ever heard anything. <laughs> you know, from scratch. Yeah, yeah. Dubai or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other comments? This is the other thing that we forget, I think, as leaders. Sometimes you're the only one who sees the changing landscape. You're the only one who is kind of thinking two or three or five or ten years down the road or even five days down the road. And isn't this something that we try to instill in our students? What we're doing in the classroom is to get them to 
to see things from a different perspective from the one they've always looked at life. But it's easy to forget. Sometimes when you're in the front of the line, you're the only one who has a good view. And this is, I, let's see, what, what would be a good example? Okay, let's go back to the all college meeting. The concept of. Um, that's an opportunity for information sharing, among other things. But everything that's going on can't possibly be shared with everybody, no matter what the setting. So everybody is involved. I have no, I have some idea what you all are doing, but I don't know the details, just like you don't know the details of what I'm doing in, in my role. But it's important to try to understand what the leader is doing because that's the only way we can understand the changing scenery and the changing environment. And if those perspectives aren't shared, then we have nowhere to go. You've got nobody to follow. There's, there's nobody paying enough attention. This has been something that, that I have learned a long time ago, but I, I think it's really critical when we think about institutional leadership because we are, after all, hierarchical. We might believe we're a democratic society and everybody has a voice, and we're here in New England, and the town meeting, and the, you know, the, the select board listens to everybody, and every citizen has a voice. We are a hierarchy, nonetheless. So there are some things at, at different levels of the organization that are gonna be shared, other things that aren't. And it's not always intentional. I don't, I don't know of many, well, I hope I don't, maybe I shouldn't say that. I would hope I don't know many leaders who intentionally keep the people that are leading in the dark about things. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, it's not a matter of intent, it's just a matter of span of control, of ability to um, keep track of what's going on in so many ways. We, don't all, we can all keep track of only so much. I read a thing, I think I wrote it down, maybe I brought it with me. Um, This is something from, again, going back to Bob Theobald, something he said. As information doubles, knowledge halves, and wisdom quarters. I love that. The more we know, the less we understand. And that's a problem in our culture right now. There is so much information 24-7 by whatever device you want to plug into or whatever book you want to read. But how much of it do we actually understand? And part of leadership is trying to always get to that level of understanding, some level of understanding. Other comments or questions? I found an article this morning, and I didn't make copies for everybody, but this is I loved it because it says five leadership lessons you can learn from your dog. <laughs> it's a golden retriever. No, this one isn't, but it should be. So I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from my dog. So here's the first one. Don't bear grudges. Even a dog who's had a negative experience once, if it goes back to that same dog and that dog is wagging its tail, that's gone and forgotten. Look pleased to see your colleagues. <laughs> That's part of that positive affect. A smile or a pleasant look on the face goes a very long way in communication. Think how you respond to a happy looking dog. Okay. Focus on the present. Let me read. Too often leaders are so busy planning for the future or learning lessons from the past they forget there is a here and now. Dogs, on the other hand, give scant thought to the future unless it involves their dinner. <laughs> they certainly don't dwell on previous mishaps. What this means is that unlike humans, dogs are firmly grounded in the present. They take each day as it comes. They don't miss out on the wonder of now. I thought that was interesting. Another one, number four, migrate. Go to a different environment. Plop down somewhere else. If you've got a problem you can't solve, change rooms, change your environment migrate. It says, if you own a dog, it's likely you will have asked yourself this question, why do I need to take my dog for a walk? There's a variety of reasons, including mental stimulation and exercise. By going to a different location from where you normally work, you could gain a new perspective on any opportunities and challenges you might face. I think
think that's interesting. Gives me, I'm going to start working out in the lobby. I don't smell so much like bacon. <laughs> if I were a dog, I'd want to be where it's not like bacon. What is anyway. with pigs? Yeah. <laughs> I have nothing against pigs. <laughs> nothing. So. Um, and finally, number five, rest. Unlike humans, dogs don't consider it a badge of honor to be busy 24-7. We do not rest enough, do we? Sometimes because of responsibilities like small children, we can't always rest, but sometimes it's important. Dogs understand the importance of recharging their batteries. Overworked and stressed out leaders would do well to follow their example. I thought those were pretty good. I like that article. There it is, from Forbes magazine. Okay, I have a little thing for you to take with you. These are some additional quotes that I found um, from, I don't know where I found the list, but I, these were my favorites. I thought they were really very good. And this is something you can just keep with you and refer to as you wish or not. Some very wise people have said really smart things over the years. <laughs> what do you think? Does anyone stand out as you read this list? <clears throat> the last one. The last one? Yeah, because. If you're an ex murderer, <laughs> don't be a good one. Depends on your definition. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like that one by Brian Tracy. Leaders think and talk about solutions, followers think and talk about problems. So I have a question about that. Yes. Um, as a leader, when your followers are talking about who's talking about it. And then try to switch the conversation, say, okay, what, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do about this? Or what, what are some alternatives to behaving this way? What can we do differently? Um, that's, that's a tough one because, again, that goes back to being a, a pessimist or an optimist, and I refer again to the pig. <laughs> but there are people who look at life as a series of, of problems and focus on everything that will go wrong so you have to take preventative measures for X, Y, or Z. Or you think your, your carpet and your car is going to get dirty, you cover it with a car mat. And then you cover the car mat with another car mat so that <laughs> original car mat doesn't get dirty. You know, you could go on endlessly about anticipating the worst. And I, I think I always anticipate, I always assume everything's going to be fine. And approach life from an idea, we can do this. I can't do it by myself, but we can figure this out together. And I think the leader with that optimistic view then can change the conversation without having to do a whole lot other than refocus the energy. And that's kind of vague, but it's worked for me. Mm -hmm. Any others? I have a question that's unrelated. Um, I don't know. Shall we take a vote? <laughs> okay, go right ahead. Have you ever worked, or what your advice would be for for working with a person on a project or uh, daily who disagrees with you all the time like on every <laughs> issue. They have like opposite world view of yours. And they um, essentially, it's a constant kind of uh, mm -hmm. butting of the head. Have you ever had that? No, I, thankfully I haven't. But it does remind me of something I read recently about that kind of a situation, especially given the political climate we're in right sure. now yes. and our polarization. And the advice was to ask questions. Well, why, why is it that you believe that? 
Where did you get the information that led you to this conclusion? And start asking the person questions instead of arguing, so you're wrong, or this is the way life is, or blah, blah, blah. Ask questions and try to get more information from the person. And sometimes, if they listen to themselves talk, they'll figure out what, what I'm believing might not make any sense, or they will at least be able to share with you the basis for their beliefs that might make it more acceptable. And we're never going to convince everybody to believe the same way we do, but at least we can try to understand it, where it's coming from. I thought that was good advice in that article, and I don't remember who wrote it, but that was pretty good. Other questions? Okay, as I have one more thing I want to read to you. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that some of you have heard this before, but to me it's a very powerful way to end our little session today and give us something to think about. This is from a, a Cherokee Indian, Indian legend. It's called The Wolves Inside of Us. Is anybody familiar with this? Yes. Okay. An elder Cherokee Native American was teaching his grandchildren about life. He said to them, a fight is going on inside of me. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves. One wolf represents fear, anger, hatred, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other stands for joy, peace, love, hope, sharing, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, friendship, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. This same fight is going on inside of you and inside every other person too. They thought about it for a minute and then one child asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The old, Cherokee simply, the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. I think that's a good reminder for all of us every day, especially if we want to be leaders as we make Great Bay such a wonderful place to work and live. And that is the end of my remarks.